there's a lot of people that say root cause medicine, you know, and they're doing root cause this and root cause that. There is no root cause. There are multiple causes, but there's a root mechanism in the development of chronic inflammatory diseases, whether it's autoimmune or cancer, heart disease, and that root mechanism is inflammation. It's always inflammation. You know, the Center for Disease Control tells us that 14 of the 15 top causes of death are chronic inflammatory diseases. It's always inflammation, except for unintentional injuries and accident. Everything else is inflammation. He's a best-selling author, award-winning filmmaker, inspirational speaker, certified nutrition coach, plant-powered athlete, and host of the number one holistic health podcast in the world, Nathan Crane. Hey, welcome back to the podcast. Before we get started, I want to give you a free gift that I have spent over a decade researching thousands of hours of peer-reviewed studies and interviewing hundreds of world-leading functional medical doctors and cancer conquerors that lays out a blueprint for helping your mind and body become a cancer fighting fortress for natural cancer prevention and healing. And that's my Amazon number one best selling book, Becoming Cancer Free. The physical copy sells for like 10 bucks on Amazon, which you know you can go get that if you want, but I'm happy to give you the ebook absolutely free. Just head over to becomingcancerfree.com and you can download that ebook instantly. Again, that's becomingcancerfree.com and it's yours as a gift for me to you for tuning into this podcast. All right, let's get to the show. Dr. Tom, welcome to the podcast. So uh, happy to have you here joining me. It's been a minute since we've talked and you're up to uh, some amazing work as usual. So uh, uh, thanks for coming on. I'm excited to talk about it with you and uh, reconnect with you. Talk about one of the things I want to talk about initially is autoimmune disease and um, dive deeply into that topic. But uh, yeah, th- yes. uh, w- welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be with you again, Nathan. So what is at the root cause of all autoimmune diseases? You know, that's a really good question to start with, because there's a lot of people that say root cause medicine, you know, and they're doing root cause this and root cause that. There is no root cause. There are multiple causes but there's a root mechanism in the development of chronic inflammatory diseases, whether it's autoimmune or cancer, heart disease, and that root mechanism is inflammation. It's always inflammation. You know, the Center for Disease Control tells us that 14 of the 15 top causes of death are chronic inflammatory diseases. It's always inflammation except for unintentional injuries and accident. Everything else is inflammation. And we all think that when you get diagnosed with something or when you start getting symptoms, you've begun to have a problem. No, it's been there for years already under the surface with this low grade chronic inflammation under the surface while you feel fine, you think you feel fine, Yeah, a little ache and pain once in a while. Yeah, I was tired yesterday afternoon. I needed a cup of coffee. You know, our mind tries to rationalize why we have these little things we notice once in a while. But those are biomarkers of accumulative inflammation in your body. And here's a basic concept. You pull at a chain, it always breaks at the weakest link. Always. It's going to be one end, the middle, the other end. It's your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys. Your weak link is determined by your genetics and antecedents, meaning how you live your life. You keep eating uh, tuna fish, then you likely have mercury toxicity. That's an antecedent. So genetics and antecedents determine where the weak link is in the chain. You keep pulling on the chain, it's gonna break. Well, what's the pull on the chain? That's the root cause. The pull on the chain is inflammation. Always, and the more time that you put into addressing where is my, first, do I have inflammation? Because most people don't have a clue that they've got this inflammatory state going on. Do I have inflammation? And then if yes, you find out you have, why do I have inflammation? 
And that is the million dollar question. Yeah. Inflammation is just the activation of your immune system. And Miss, Mrs. Patient, your immune system is the armed forces in your body. They're to protect you. There's an army, a navy, an air force, a marines, a coast guard. We call them IGA, IgG, IgE, IgM, cytokines. They're different branches of the immune system, different branches of your armed forces there to protect you. So the million dollar question is, what is it trying to protect you from? Because the inflammation is pulling on the chain. Well, why is your immune system activated? That's the root mechanism behind all chronic diseases is investigating where is the inflammation coming from. Yeah, and for people who don't realize, you know, not all information not all inflammation is bad, right? You have acute inflammation which is, you know, as you mentioned an injury for example, you sprain your anchor, ankle whatever, it's like your body is sending inflammatory cytokines to that area to swell it up, to heal that tissue. But in my research with cancer for the past decade plus, when we're looking at chronic inflammation, so just so people don't get confused, acute inflammation or inflammation to a, you know, attack a virus or bacteria infection or whatever is good for you. It's your, your body's defense is just as you said. Chronic inflammation where it's low grade is continuously happening 24 seven. That is actually one of the core causes of cancer. And as you said, one of the underlying mechanisms of all chronic diseases, autoimmune disease, neurodegenerative disease, et cetera, diabetes, every single one of these chronic diseases has an inflammatory component to it. What's unique about cancer specifically that I've discovered is a cancer that chronic inflammation is one of the core causes of cancer. So what causes inflammation? I wanna ask you that next, and, and I think that's where you're going. But number two, like for cancer, the process of having chronic inflammation actually damages the cell's integrity and can actually cause cancer because of that chronic chronic inflammatory state where it's where it's um, degradation repair degradation repair degradation repair the process of that actually causes cancer which is uh something we want to avoid obviously so um back to that question is you know what is at the root cause of chronic inflammation well nathan you're absolutely right um i uh if we didn't have an active immune system protecting us, we wouldn't live one day on the planet. And that's not an exaggeration. We're constantly being assaulted by things that can be damaging to us in what we breathe and what we eat and the water we drink. So inflammation is not bad for you. It's, it saves your life every single day. Excessive inflammation is bad for you. And that's the million dollar question. You know, I just um, had the privilege uh, last week of interviewing Fran Drescher, the nanny. And, you know, Fran founded Cancer Schmancer. Uh, she's a 23-year survivor of uterine cancer. And she asked the question, why did I get cancer? And she was very grateful to her oncologist. She still sees that oncologist. She was telling me she's become a friend and she saved her life. Fran feels that way. She saved my life, but she couldn't answer any of the questions that I had about why did I get cancer? So Fran did a deep dive and founded, wrote the book, Cancer Schmancer, and then founded the organization to educate people on all of this. And that's the million dollar question. What is it that's activating the immune system to produce this excessive inflammation? And there is no root cause to that. There are many causes. It can easily be food sensitivities. You're eating a food, but if it doesn't make you sick, if you don't feel bad when you eat the food, you think it's okay for you. Well, no, it's not. You know, it may be activating your immune system. And we know, for example, with wheat as a model, for every one person that gets gut symptoms with wheat, there are eight that don't. They feel fine when they eat wheat. They get brain symptoms, brain fog, or seizures. They get uh, joint symptoms or skin symptoms. Listen to this one. In the journal Gastroenterology, they looked at children with drug-resistant epilepsy, which means that they've been on at least three medications that don't work to qualify for the diagnosis of drug 
resistant epilepsy, 50% of children with drug resistant epilepsy go into complete remission on a gluten free diet. 50%. 50%. This podcast is brought to you by Econugenics, the makers of Pectisol modified citrus pectin. Pectisol is clinically proven and backed by over 80 studies, six patents, and 30 plus years of clinical success. We're all familiar with inflammation and chronic diseases like cancer, but have you ever wondered where these health issues actually come from? You need to read more about an inflammatory protein called Galactin-3. It's been called by thousands of practitioners and research papers one of the root causes of nearly every chronic illness. Pectisol modified citrus pectin is the most researched Galactin-3 blocker on the market. It's been recommended by thousands of doctors for over 30 years to support oncology, immune health, and gentle detoxification. I personally use Pectisol, and I highly recommend it. Start your journey toward a healthier you with Pectisol Modified Citrus Pectin, and Econugenics is offering our listeners 15% off at econugenics.link forward slash ncrane15. You'll be able to use NCRANE15 as a discount code to get 15% off your order. Again, that's econugenics.link forward slash NCRANE15. Have you heard of PEMF therapy for cancer? Well, this podcast is brought to you by Dr. Pollock, and he wants to share with you the groundbreaking research of pulsed electromagnetic field therapy in the treatment of cancer. Studies show PEMF therapy can help control the cancer process and give safe, non-toxic, and non-invasive symptom management. PMF therapy may enhance other cancer support and treatments, lower inflammation, and promote tissue healing. Studies show it's possible to improve your general well-being and recuperate from surgery, radiation, and chemo better and more quickly. Embrace a comprehensive approach to cancer treatment with PMF therapy, a vital tool on your path to prevention, treatment, and recovery. For caring and professional guidance and recommendations from Dr. Pollock, go to drpollock.com forward slash Intro to Cancer. That's D R P A W L U K dot com forward slash intro to cancer. You know, with the cold and flu season here, it's critically important that we enhance and strengthen our immune systems. Yes, would you agree? The problem is, though, that there's so much confusion out there when it comes to what actually works for our bodies and for our health. Well, I'll tell you what I used I use Maison Beljansky's wellness products. Maison Beljansky's products are backed by science to not only help empower the immune system, but can support detoxification and contribute to our overall health. Coming from Europe, the all natural Beljansky formulas are now available in the United States and are recommended by top doctors everywhere. A lot of the colleagues I work with, functional medicine practitioners that work with patients with all kinds of diseases, are recommending Maison Beljansky's products to their very own patients. As a special sponsor of this podcast, Maison Beljansky has included a very special discount offer for all of my listeners. You can get 15% off your first order using the promo code Nathan. And you'll always enjoy free shipping when you order four products or more. You can grab your wellness products today at MaisonBeljansky.com. That's M-A-I-S-O-N-B-E-L-J-A-N-S-K-I. MaisonBeljansky.com. And use code Nathan for 15% off. Hey, so if you've been following me for any time now, you know that I often talk about Helin 951, the nitrogen fermented organic soy drink. I first learned about it at an integrative cancer event years ago, and I've been taking this myself for a long time. It's so potent and it has a strong flavor, so I add their organic mint powder to it, and it's easy to take any time of day. I usually take it in the mornings. You know, I'm constantly looking into natural health products, and the ones that catch my eye are the ones with years of proven results and the science and research to back them up. I love that Helin 951 checks all of these boxes. Made from a unique 100% organic soybean grown in the high mountains of Mongolia, Helin 951 has some incredible health properties. Just a few of the benefits are more energy, better sleep, detox, longevity, better immune function, and some fantastic anti-cancer compounds. 
The folks over at Helan have made a page just for our followers to learn more. You can head over to helan951.com forward slash crane. That's H-A-E-L-A-N 951.com forward slash crane. They have special discounted packages there for you to get you started. And if you use the promo code crane, C-R-A-N-E, at checkout, they will also give you free shipping. So head over and grab this special offer for yourself and use the free shipping promo code CRANE or just give them a call if that's easier for you. They are so easy to work with and have over 32 years in the industry. Again, that's helan951.com forward slash CRANE. Say that again, 50% of children with drug-resistant epilepsy. So, so they have full-blown epilepsy. They go into seizures and you know, the, basically epilepsy. Full blown. That's right. You you don't get that that diagnosis unless they've tried three epileptic drugs and that don't, don't work. work. Wow. And 50% 50 of, them of them get completely healed or go into remission when they get they they, they, they go into bed. remission, not not healing. You don't heal from that kind of stuff. You you put it into remission. Yeah. Right? I, I have a buddy, I had him on the podcast. He, you know, has been uh, epileptic and he cleaned up his diet, got alcohol you know, et cetera, et cetera, exercise, meditate, all these things. And he has been, uh, he hasn't had a symptom of epilepsy for 13 years, I think. I think it's correct. Exactly. Remember? He stopped pulling on the chain. Yeah. He, and because the weak link for him was his brain, which means that gluten for these children was pulling on their chain. And now why don't our neurologists know this? Because it's published in a gastroenterology journal. Mm. And neurologists don't read gastroenterology journals. They read neurology journals. You know, so foods are well, they should, a trigger. They should realize that the neurology and gastroenterology are deeply and intimately directly connected, which, you know, more scientists and doctors are, are learning this today, right? The, yeah, the, the gut-brain connection we have yeah, that's, in our gut. But right, most still right. don't know that is what you're saying. Right, right. And, and uh, that's your job and my job is to educate <laughs> them on that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, why, why can people go to Europe? I mean, I've heard this anecdotally, so I can't say it's, it's you know, guaranteed. But I, I've literally heard it from so many people who have gluten sensitivities and they're aware of gluten sensitivities and they, here in the U.S. And then they go to Europe. They go to Italy, for example. They eat wheat the whole time they're there, pasta, bread. And they said they have no reactions at all. They come back here, yeah. they can't have any gluten. Why is that? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. And that's, um, it's, it's an easy answer once you know the science. That the reaction to the proteins of wheat that, the, that activate the immune system and cause inflammation, it's the proteins of wheat, the gluten and other proteins that activate the immune system. It doesn't activate the gut for bloating and gas and constipation and diarrhea very often. It's the FODMAPs in wheat, the fermentable carbohydrates that activate the bloating and the gas, which means the symptoms. Oh, I don't feel so good when I eat wheat, I get all bloated and blah, blah, blah. And doc, I can go to Europe and I can eat the wheat. Well, the, that's, there's only one reason why. That's because the wheat in Europe is lower in FODMAPs. So you don't get the gut symptoms, but you still activate the immune response. So if the weak link in your chain is your brain, when you come home, you're more vulnerable to getting seizures again. Really? So are you saying there's not any safe wheat to eat on the planet today? Uh, I guess the way I would answer that question is that Maureen Leonard at Harvard, a famous gastroenterologist, she researched that subject and uh, she looked at over 60 papers, published papers on that topic. And she said that gluten activates transient intestinal permeability, the leaky gut, in all humans who consume it. Without exception, everyone has two things happen when they eat wheat. One, they activate leaky gut. Leaky gut means the, the cells open up a little bit inside your gut. So water comes from the body into the lumen of the gut. And it's a safety mechanism to wash out the toxin 
that it's just identified. That's what leaky gut is for. And it does the second thing, it activates the major amplifier of inflammation called NF-kappa B in the gut to kill this threat. And Alessio Fasano at Harvard has published a number of papers that talk about this. Gluten is misinterpreted as a harmful component of a bug. That the protein structure of wheat looks like the outer shell of a microorganism, a bug. So your immune system, when you eat this thing, wheat, you know, you have the same body as your ancestor thousands of years ago, same kidneys, same liver, same immune system. We use our brains more, so we've got creature comforts and more food available, but we have the same body. And our ancestors before agriculture were nomads. They followed the herds. And so their first priority was always food. So they're walking around, they see something, they pick it up, first they smell it, then they nibble it, then they eat it. And if it had bad bugs that they couldn't identify and they ate it, right inside the first part of the small intestine, we have sentries standing guard. Uh, I think of the soldiers at Buckingham Palace with those big hats. You know, they're as dormant as can be. They're stiff and still and they don't move. And in our guts, we've got these sentry standing guard called toll-like receptors. And they're right inside, they're all over the body, but right inside the first part of the small intestine. And they're watching everything that's coming out of the stomach into the first part of the small intestine. And if they see any threat whatsoever, they activate uh, intestinal permeability, the protein zonulin to increase permeability, to wash it out. More water comes into the gut to wash it out with the poop and they activate NF-kappa B. That's the job of toll-like receptors in the first part of our small intestine. And it was Fasano that explained to us in 1997, this mechanism. And he said, I mean, in the papers, you, you see it in the science. Gluten is misinterpreted as a harmful component of a bug. Misinterpreted because by our immune system is what you're saying. By our immune intestine. system. Be because it, the amino acid structure of these undigestible parts of wheat, the proteins that no human can digest, the amino acid structure of those pieces of wheat look like the amino acid structure of the outside of a bug. And so your immune system gets activated in every human when you're exposed to gluten. So why do some people have symptoms and others don't? Because, well, well the symptoms are, uh, you mean gut symptoms are from FODMAPs. My gosh, just, if you're talking about symptoms in general, just Google gluten and schizophrenia. Here come the studies, how sometimes it works. Yahoo, um, it, it puts it in remission. And this is from psychiatrists in psychiatry journals. They do an OMG. Oh, my God, look at this. One year in a gluten-free diet and the patient's off all medications and stable. And you see those kinds of case studies again and again. Just Google gluten and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, Yehuda Schoenfeld is the godfather of autoimmunity. And what I mean by that is that in his immunology department at Tel Aviv University, there are many, many docs who have gone back to get their PhD in immunology. 26 of them, there are many more, but when I interviewed Schoenfeld, 26 of them chair departments of immunology in med schools and hospitals around the world. They're his students. This is the godfather. He published a paper in March of 2022. And uh, the paper, the title of the paper was The Effects of a Gluten-Free Diet on Non-Celiac Autoimmune Disease. And he did a literature search and he showed that 79% of the patients get better on a, a autoimmune patients get better on a gluten-free diet. And this was confirmed in 65% of the studies. 70, not every patient, not every time, 79% of the patients, 79.5% to be exact, get better on a gluten-free diet. And then he showed the autoimmune diseases that he researched. 
there were 28 different autoimmune diseases. The most common that responds is Hashimoto's thyroid disease, and it's 87% of Hashimoto's patients get better on a gluten-free diet. The next most common one was psoriasis. And the third most common one was inflammatory bowel disease. And once again, these are not celiac patients. These are other autoimmune diseases. And then he had uh, pancreatitis, autoimmune pancreatitis, autoimmune myocarditis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, inflammatory bowel disease. The list went on and on and on. 28 different autoimmune diseases that get better on a gluten-free diet because every human has this inflammatory mechanism that occurs and this leaky gut that occurs when they're exposed to wheat, every human. And when you look at the development of autoimmune diseases, there is a perfect storm in the development of autoimmune diseases, which is centered around leaky gut. So when you get leaky gut, you become extremely vulnerable to developing an autoimmune condition dependent on where the weak link in your chain is. Um, I want to get into what leaky gut is and why that, why that happens. I, I, I understand a little bit about the mechanisms of it, but I'd love for you to talk about that. But I want to stay on gluten specifically for a moment because do you think, well, okay. First of all, those studies that um, were referenced where he saw, you know, significant improvement in 28 different autoimmune diseases, 79% of people getting better by going on a gluten-free diet, which is massive. It's incredible because right. we know there's at, least, there's at least 100 autoimmune diseases we know of. And if you actually group, it's not grouped in the data like cancer, all cancers are grouped under cancer. You know, all diabetes, you know, we have like four or five forms of diabetes. Now they're all, you know, basically, well, not, not neurodegenerative diabetes, but diabetes, heart disease, we, all the autoimmune diseases aren't technically grouped under one disease profile right now in the data of diagnosis and death. But if you did, what I've seen is actually that would be the number one killer above cancer and heart disease. Is that right? That's right. That's right. So that's, that's, that's unbelievable to think about and knowing that the mechanism for these autoimmune diseases seem to be pretty much the same. And we can talk about, I'd love for you to talk about the nuances about that. And maybe the solutions are actually very similar. Um, but were those studies RCTs? Were these, were they randomized controlled trials? Where was this? Oh, there's data? hundreds of studies. There's hundreds, hundreds. There's not like three or four what type of study, there, there's every type of study on this. When, when, when you look at these, you say, what, what? And you just keep going deeper and deeper into it and it becomes, how can you not recognize this? Well, you know, there's no evidence. Uh, no, excuse me, you mean you haven't read the evidence? You know, so uh, Alessio Fasano, uh, professor of medicine, Harvard Medical School, professor of nutrition, Harvard School of Public Health, chief pediatric gastroenterology at Mass General at Harvard, the director, Celiac Research Center at Harvard, the director of mucosal immunology at Harvard. This guy's got five titles. Any one title is a lifelong goal for someone at the top of their game. He's got five. We think he's going to win the Nobel Prize. We really, truly do. Uh, because it was him and his team in 1997 that identified the mechanism by which this thing we now know as leaky gut occurs. The production of the protein zonulin, and it opens up the junctions to have water come into the gut to wash out cholera, wash out the toxin that the person's been exposed to. That's how it occurs, is by this protein zonulin increasing. I use the analogy of shoelaces. It's like your cells in your gut are connected together by shoelaces. And when you have a high school kid that's not tying his shoes, his shoes flop on his feet. That's a leaky gut. That's when the shoelaces are untied. And it's the protein zonulin that unties the shoelaces. So why does that happen? It happens because you need more water in the gut to uh, wash out the threat, whatever the threat is. 
So it's a so that's a normal biological safety defense mechanism, leaky gut by itself. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. It's normal. It's life saving. Those ancestors that did not have a good functioning toll like receptor system in their gut, they died and they didn't reproduce. Their lineage died off. Those that had good defense mechanisms to protect themselves against toxins in the food that they may have been exposed to when they're scavenging for food as hunter gatherers, they lived and they reproduced and they developed that, that defense mechanism to protect themselves. So we so all inherited that. So if someone says we I have all, leaky, if someone says I have leaky gut, that's not really the context. That's not really like a accurate thing to say, right? I well, have right. Leaky, what, what's like what's leaky, accurate leaky to gut. say? Yeah, go ahead. What's accurate to say is I have excessive leaky go. gut. Like Everybody's excessive got leaky inflammation. Gut. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. So Fasano and his team, he is so careful of what he says always so that he's not misquoted because he's out there, you know, he, he's charge of, you know, he's got five different titles at Harvard. When you see, and he's got hundreds of papers to his name, research papers. I think it's about 400 now. I'm not sure. I stopped counting a few years ago. Uh, uh, you'll see eight authors on a research paper. And the last one, Alessio Fasano, he put his stamp on it right? This paper he wrote himself. That's rare. All by himself, meaning he really wanted to get this message out. So if you, if you grant this guy that, all right, he's one of the leaders in the field, okay, and he's got a number of titles at a very prestigious research university in the world, okay. So what's his message? The title of the paper, All Disease, begins in the, quote, leaky gut, the role of the protein zonulin in the development of chronic inflammatory diseases. Now, remember I said at the beginning, 14 of the 15 top causes of death are chronic inflammatory diseases. And here we have this guy, uh, this top of the world researcher with so many credentials telling us all disease begins in the leaky gut. When you read that paper, it changes your paradigm because he talks about the perfect storm in the development of chronic inflammatory diseases. There are five factors in the perfect storm. First is genetics. Not much you can do about the genes that you've been given. That, yeah, that's a deck of cards you've got. But there's a whole lot you can do with those genes now, some doctors say, well, we're going to turn that gene off. And you can't turn genes off. Genes operate on dimmer switches. And you certainly can dim down the expression of a gene or turn up the expression of the gene. And for a younger, more vital life, you want to turn up the genes of anti-inflammation and regeneration and turn down the genes of inflammation and tissue destruction. You know, that's, that's a rational goal. Yeah, it's the expression. The first, it's it's more accurate to say the expression of those genes, right? Like you said, exactly. You can, you can turn them up. You can turn them down. You can't completely turn the genes. Don't just go away. They don't just disappear. <laughs> you still have That's them. Exactly right. They're just not expressing into, you know, multiple, you know, replicating into, you know, the DNA uh, of those genes. Yeah. It's, look, if you've got the ApoE4 gene for Alzheimer's, and you've had two. Um, family members that have died of dementia, you know, you, you'd be pretty scared, but it's a wake up call. And anytime my patients have NAPOE4, I sit down with them and I say, you know what? I have to read to you from the book. And they look at me and I say, the book of life. You need to understand the weak link in your chain is your brain. That's the weak link in the chain. Can't do anything about that. But we certainly can do a lot as to how much you pull on that chain because the weak link is going to break that's one of your weak links patients understand that and so okay how do we not pull on the chain reduce inflammation reduce the pull on the chain and i have so many patients that we've done their tests you know we we do follow-up tests first when we do our first test they're a mess 
you know, they've got lots of, I mean, the, the test that I'd recommend everyone do because it'll shock the hell out of you is the Neural Zoomer Plus. It's a blood test in the laboratory is Vibrant Wellness. I have no association with them, uh, but it is the best test in the world. It identifies 53 markers of inflammation in your brain. And it's shocking, Nathan. Yeah, I mean, if your audience listens to what I'm about to tell you, Blue Cross Blue Shield published in February of 2020. They said, we've got a real problem here, but no one paid attention to it because that's when the virus came out. And so everyone was caught thinking about the virus, right? But they said, we've got a real problem here. In the previous four-year period, there was a 407% increase in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's in four years in 30 to 44 year olds. Wow. It's like, wake up world, wake up. You That's do it. the Neural Zoomer Plus, and as I said, it'll shock the hell out of you. Same thing and happened how inflamed with cancer. your brain is right now. Yeah, the, What's I'm, that? A, I'm gonna do that test, by the way. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, the, because uh, I'm curious. Oh, Same excuse me, when, when, when you do that test, I will come on and we'll interpret it online. Okay. So that so that people uh, on your show, so that people can follow along. Okay. And if they want, they they should do the test also. Okay. That's very cool. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for offering that. Yeah. It's the same thing with cancer that we've seen. You know, young people think, oh, I, I don't have to worry about cancer. It's, it doesn't run in my family or I'm, I'm 30. I don't have to worry about it. Recent study just came out looking at a 79% increase in cancer diagnoses in young people under 50 yes. in the last yes. 30 years alone. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, this, this, this modernized diet and lifestyle, this, this mechanistic civilization, this extreme exposure to man-made toxic chemicals, you know, the, the excessive stress, all the things we can talk about that actually cause chronic inflammation that damage the mitochondria that are leading to these chronic diseases. Um, it is exceeding all understanding of, of, you know, young people being diagnosed with chronic diseases at higher rates and younger than ever before than anyone ever thought. Ever, yeah. And, and it's very, yeah. and these things are primarily preventable as we know, but yeah, if oh, you exactly. don't know about it and you just keep doing the same old things, guess what's going to happen? Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. A paper came out six weeks ago. They have new technology to identify plastic in bottles of water. And we've heard about the dangers of microplastics, but now they have laser technology to identify nanoplastics, which are billionth of a gram is a nanoparticle of plastic. And in three different brands of water, they looked at one liter bottles of water in plastic bottles in three different brands. The average was 240,000 nanoparticles of plastic. Jeez. And that stuff, when you drink it, it goes right through into your bloodstream and it goes right through the blood brain barrier into your brain. It accumulates in your brain and it activates the immune system in your brain to fight this toxin that's in there. And you do the Neural Zoomer Plus and you come back and you've got 25 of the 53 markers elevated in your brain. And by definition, when you have elevated antibodies, you're killing off more cells than you're making. So it's no surprise that there's a 407% increase in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's in 30 to 44 year olds. Because people don't recognize how toxic our world is. They don't want to hear that their favorite tutti frutti lipstick is full of so much crap that accumulates in your body. Excuse me, you know, but um, it, wake up, world. All right, back to Pisano. Well, Number back one. on that point, before we go back to Pisano, I want to say because you just mentioned water. That's why I drink and recommend stainless steel or glass. Absolutely, stainless steel Absolutely. or glass. We know stainless steel doesn't leach heavy metals. Aluminum does leach heavy metals into your liquids. There's actually um, the Stanley large cups that are now the big fad. My daughter got one the other day, by the way, it was how I learned about this stainless steel. Okay. The bottom of it, if you look at the bottom and it has a little cap on it, that cap actually is made with lead. And over mm. time, 
that cap on the inside wears down and leaches lead into your water. So you think you're drinking stainless steel water, right? Not leaching, mm -hmm. heavy metals. And yet these many, many bottles have been tested and filled with lead. So stay, even stainless steel, you got to really look out for what you're getting or just go glass. But, you know, these, um, uh, these ones have been tested significantly. The hydro flasks, uh, there's no cap in the bottom. It's a dimple. And so, you know, these don't leach. But simple things we can do, right? Filter your water, filter your air, drink from stainless steel, drink from glass. You're still going to be exposed to toxins, but we can mitigate. We can reduce our risk significantly. Um, that is I just exactly want to say that. Right. I also want to say one that other thing exactly about the right. brain, the neurotoxins in the brain, because I think this is important. You have all these neurotoxins collecting in the brain causing chronic inflammation. What a lot of people don't realize, the only way to drain to remove these toxins from your brain is to activate your glymphatic system. Am I right? Yeah. And the only way to activate that or to fully, fully release the toxins from your brain where they leave the glymphatic system from your brain and get dumped into the rest of your lymphatic system in your body is to get adequate sleep. It's turned down when we're awake and it's turned all the way up when we're sleeping. But the research I've done, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it, on average, it takes about eight hours of sleep to do a full glymphatic drain of the brain. And how many people are actually sleeping eight hours? How many people are not getting as many of those toxins out of their brain uh, as they could be? Well, you bring up a really good point, and that's uh, sleep is critically important. It's one of the primaries in the development of uh, low-grade inflammation. There are other ways to drain lymphatics, but that's the primary and, and number one most important is getting adequate sleep. And you are right. Uh, uh, lymphatics only drain when we are in a parasympathetic dominant state where we are, our bodies are relaxed. It's like the 10th day of a two-week vacation with no kids. You know, that when you're in that <laughs> frame of mind... When you're in that frame of mind and the biggest <laughs> the biggest decision of the day is is lunch at the pool or at the beach, right? <laughs> that yeah, doesn't happen heaven. very this often for heaven. most I'm of us. I'm actually missing my kids right now. It's been 10 days, but this is heaven. I'll enjoy it. <laughs> yes, right, 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 right. That's a parasympathetic dominant state. And for most of us, the only time we get there is when we're in a good deep sleep mode. So that's one reason why. But if you were someone that meditates, I have a friend that's been, well, my friend Jeffrey Smith, who founded the Institute for Responsible Technology, mm -hmm. really brought to our attention in the world about the dangers of glyphosate. Uh, Jeffrey has meditated every day for something like 34 years now, something like that. And so, you know, people can develop that tool of getting into a parasympathetic dominant state when you're awake. But that's why one reason why it's so critically important to get quality sleep is that you only heal when you're in that parasympathetic dominant state, when your heart rates relax, your breathing is slow and deeper. And that it's, it's the only time we heal. And draining the brain, uh, activating the glymphatics is a major part of that. Okay, so Fasano's perfect storm. Number one is genetics. Number two of the five factors in the perfect storm is environmental triggers that activate our genes. And it's, it's your environment that has its fingers on the knob of the dimmer switch of your genes turning your genes up, turning your genes down. It's your environment. That means the outdoor environment and also the indoor environment. All of the accumulated toxins that you may have, or do you have enough of the right enzymes? Um, do you have enough of the right hormones? The internal environment and the external environment have their fingers on the dial of your genetics. Okay, that's number two. And given the lives that we live, most of us, I venture to say all of us, have way too many of the wrong things. The most common source of environmental triggers is what's on the end of your fork, what you put in your mouth. And for most of us, 
we are out of balance in our gut between the good guys and the bad guys. Now that's called dysbiosis. That's the geek term for it, but it means too many bad guys and not enough good guys. And when you have too many bad guys in your gut, you have an inflammatory state in your gut. The immune, 75 to 80% of the immune systems in your gut, because that's where the most threat is. So that's where most of the army needs to be to protect you or for our ancestors walking around looking for food, picking stuff up and sniffing it, nibbling and then eating it. 75 to 80% of the immune systems in your gut. So it gets activated to protect you from all of the garbage that you've put down there over the years. It gets activated to protect you. So you get this inflammation in your gut from the too many bad guys, not enough good guys. And the inflammation in the gut creates number four. So what's number four? Mrs. Patient, your digestive system is a tube. It starts at your mouth with saliva, and that's why you have to chew, and it goes all the way to the other end. One big long tube, 20 to 25 feet long. The inside of the tube is lined with cheesecloth. So when you swallow a bite of a hamburger, and you chew it three, four times and gulp it down, as opposed to chewing it 15, 20 times like we should, but we gulp it down, you've got these big clumps of meat in there. That stuff can't get into your bloodstream. It's got to be broken down smaller and smaller and smaller. That's what digestion is. It's the enzymes. So if you think of protein like a pearl necklace, the acid in your stomach undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. Now you have a string of pearls. They're called amino acids. They're all put together to make protein. And our enzymes act as scissors to cut that pearl necklace smaller and smaller, snip, 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 until you're down to each pearl of the pearl necklace, which goes right through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. That's absorption. And when it gets in the bloodstream, your bloodstream is just a highway, shoo, there it goes on the highway. Everything's going in the same direction, but everything's bouncing into each other, you know, but now you've got these raw materials, these amino acids, that you're called the building blocks of muscle cell and bone cell and brain cell. But they've, they've got in, they went through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. Now your body can use them to make new bone cells and brain cells and organ cells. When you have dysbiosis, too many bad guys, not enough good guys in the gut, creating this inflammatory state, the inflammation tears the cheesecloth. Now, You've got tears in the cheesecloth. So bigger clumps of the food that you're eating can get through the torn cheesecloth into the bloodstream before it's been broken down small enough. Those bigger clumps are called macromolecules. And these macromolecules get in the bloodstream. Shoo, there they go. They're in the bloodstream now. That's number four, leaky gut is the tears in the cheesecloth. Now you've got these tears in the, and it doesn't matter if it's chicken or raspberry or whatever it is, if these macromolecules get through into the bloodstream, now your immune system says, whoa, what's that in the bloodstream? That's not something I can use to make new bone cells or brain cells, I better fight that. Now you make antibodies to chicken or to beef, or to raspberry, or to tomato, it doesn't matter. That's number five, chronic systemic inflammation. And now you have a food Pulling sensitivity. On the chain. Now you have a food sensitivity That's right. to those foods. It's not those Yeah, or, or if you have a chronic yeast are... infection, you know, or, or if you have a chronic yeast infection in your gut, or you got a mold infection in your gut, or you've got uh, uh, artificial sweeteners, uh, that that kill the good guys, or you're exposed to glyphosate from eating conventional foods that kill the good guys in the gut and create all this inflammation that tears the cheesecloth. I mean, there's a lot to learn of what to do, but the goal is heavy metal to recognize all disease begins in the leaky gut, and that pull on the chain that manifests wherever your genetic and antecedent determined weak link is that pull on the chain is the chronic systemic inflammation that comes from the gut. 
So that's Fasano's message. All disease begins in the leaky. This is PhD material. You can't get it in one hour. Hopefully you'll you'll listen to this again and again. I think I think I I mean, this is modern science backed up significantly by extensive amounts of research. But I think Hippocrates said the same thing 2000 years ago. Right. Uh, Basically, all disease begins in the gut. And so, you know, he had he had theory and his own personal anecdotal evidence. But now it's it's very backed up by hard science. And um, and I believe it. And as you said, when people clean up the culprits that are causing the excessive leaky gut that are causing the tears in the intestinal lining is creating that intestinal permeability. Once that gets cleaned up and healed, because it's very possible to clean that up and heal it because intestine cells replicate every what, 24 hours, right? So um, is it 24 or 48 hours, three, three, three to five days, it three to five on days the study and, and very and fast, what part right? Of the intestine you're talking about. Yeah. Very fast. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on part of the intestine. So it's, you can, you know, heal it up and clean it up, but not if you keep putting in the same, uh, uh, the same components that are damaging the intestinal lining, which is you said, um, you know, chronic inflammation is doing it too many bad guys, not enough good guys in terms of bacteria, fungus, but also heavy metals tear up the intestinal lining, right? Um, chronic yes. stress causes that chronic inflammation and can tear up the intestinal lining. Isn't that right? There's a number of factors yes. that are that are contributing towards it. Yes, exactly, exactly. The goal becomes to understand how do I build a healthy, diverse microbiome? Really quick, uh, in, before we in get into gut. that, I want, and, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that if you can, if you, if you have some time. But before, on the wheat question, is it Gluten in all foods, rye, barley, wheat, um, einkorn, kamut, is it all forms of gluten or is it specific forms of gluten? That Good question. Glut- gluten, gluten is a category of foods. There's gluten in rice. There's gluten in corn, in wheat, in rye, in barley. But the family of gluten proteins that includes wheat, rye, and barley. Those are the ones that no human can digest. Those are the ones that activate. They activate toll-like receptor four in the proximal part of the small intestine. Wow. So, I mean, if anyone walks away from this and goes, Man, I should keep eating wheat. Uh, you missed the message. Re, you know, rewind it and listen to this again, because <laughs> the, the number one takeaway here is, you know, any gluten from wheat, rye, and barley, um, including until sa- un, Satan. Until a, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, we should we should until, avoid it completely until a person gets sick enough. And they've tried enough other things that work a little bit, but don't work really well. Until they're sick enough, many people won't pay attention to this. And once they do, and they feel like a million bucks in a short period of time, you know, they just feel so much better. And they say, well, I'm going to go by and try again. And it's, it, it always makes my day when I see a patient who said, Doc, I went back and I tried some pizza. You know, I was feeling great, but I, you know, I, I had some pizza Oh my God, did I feel terrible the next day? All of my symptoms, I said, great. Oh, great, congratulations. Now nobody can argue with you. You know, you know, you know that you can't do this anymore. You just can't do it. You cross the threshold. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I discovered it was corn for me and it took me years. I mean, because it wasn't, I wouldn't eat corn and then feel sick immediately. It was, what I discovered was an accumulation of corn in my diet. And then I would, then yep. all of a sudden these, these symptoms would explode, you know, vomiting and, and diarrhea and just, you know, it was like the flu and it, it would happen consistently. And I, I mean, I went through so many parasite cleanses, you know, uh, fungus cleanses, fasting, you name it. So many different things and tests and all this until it was like, stop eating corn. And when I, and once I kind of figured that, I was like, okay, maybe it's the corn. I stopped wheat a long time ago. You know, it was like gluten's not good for you. You know, I figured that out years ago, but was still eating corn. And for whatever reason, for me, it was the corn. And then once I got that yeah. out, you know, knock on wood, 
not a symptom from that in the past couple of years now. Marvelous. Um, Congratulations. So on I wonder it. if it's, 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 it's so could it be the gluten, the, the gluten protein from that from corn? And now it was always sure. organic corn. It wasn't yeah. genetically modified. It was always organic. So yeah. I can't, I can't yeah. say it. Mm. Yeah. There's some, there's some uh, uh, protein that activated your immune system. Mm. Given that it was always organic. Yeah. Because most corn nowadays is GMO corn. Yep. And it's loaded with glyphosate and that has a whole world of problems all by itself. And pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, especially like glyphosate, they right. also tear up the intestinal lining, right? Yeah. Um, let me tell you one study that um, uh, is a reality check and it actually brings some hope of what people can do. In the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2019, they published a study from Harvard and the editors of the journal made a comment. They said, this is an elegant study using sophisticated biomarkers to prove their point. Now, the editors of the journal, the American Medical Association, don't say that very often. They don't give a stamp of approval to an article, but they did here. So I thought, oh, okay, I can't argue with this. And they looked at couples going to assisted fertility centers, which I would suspect a large percentage of your audience would be in that category. They've got friends or perhaps themselves, they've done this or considering it. And they ruled out all of the known factors that contribute to success or failure. Cigarette smoking, alcohol consumption, exercise, no exercise, uh, socioeconomic class, race. They ruled all that out in an elegant way that you couldn't argue with the science. And they looked at one factor and one factor only. How many servings of fruits and vegetables was the woman eating a day? And when they looked at that and they divided them into fourths, the lowest number, the second, the third, and the highest number of servings per day of fruits and vegetables, the results were shocking. Everybody knows, well, the more fruits and vegetables, the better. No. If you were in the highest category of fruit and vegetable consumption, compared to those in the lowest category of fruit and vegetable consumption, you had an 18% less likelihood of successful implantation. And if you did get pregnant, you had a 26% less likelihood of a live birth. You lost the baby to miscarriages and stillbirths more often, much more, a quarter more, 26% more. What? The more fruits and vegetables I eat, the worse the outcome? Yes. And you can't argue with the study. It's in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and the editors made a comment, elegant study using sophisticated biomarkers to prove their point. Now, here's the good news. There was a subgroup of women who were eating organic. And in that category, the results were the exact opposite. The more fruits and vegetables you were eating, the better the outcome, the healthier the pregnancy and healthy delivery. And here's the really good news. Women were put in the category of organic consumption if they ate three meals a week organic. Not three a day, mm. three a week. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be moving in the right direction. And we think it's because, I think, this is my opinion, the authors didn't look into any of that, but my opinion is if these women are eating organic a minimum of three times a week, they probably bought organic shampoo and you know organic mouthwash and toothpaste, and they're doing other things to try and be healthy, yeah. which is what you're all about here on this show, is all the little things that you can do to be exactly. healthy. Exactly. Right? Well, and you imagine just in, uh, if, if you're eating a conventional diet, you think you're eating healthy, you're eating fruits and vegetables, which are great, um, you know, whole grains, legumes, things like that, but they're non-organic, they literally can have, you know, a hundred plus different pesticides in them. And many of these pesticides we know are either probable carcinogens 
or endocrine disruptors or haven't been right. studied long term on their health impacts yet, but they are uh, man made laboratory synthesized chemicals, which we know Look, and most of those are not great for your health. And then you add on top of that the hundreds of these chemicals, the 140,000 plus man made chemicals that have been made in the last 75 years. Many of them are neuroendocrine disruptors, they are um, uh, endocrine disruptors, they are carcinogenic or probable carcinogenic. On, in your shampoos, your lotions, your toothpaste, all those things. And now you're swimming in this soup of just toxic chemicals destroying your body from the inside out and the outside in. And then you have someone that goes, you know what, I'm going to eat mostly organic. I'm going to switch my body care products to mostly organic. And you eliminate hundreds and hundreds of chemicals overnight. What do you yes. think is going to happen to your health? <laughs> of course, you're going to get better. You're I going mean, to have a healthy pregnancy and, and, and more success with uh, uh, assisted fertility centers. And, absolutely. you know, in Europe, uh, they outlaw over 20,000 chemicals. They can't be brought into the country in any form whatsoever. In the U.S., it's 12. That's crazy. 20,000 versus 12. It's all about dollars. It's all about uh, lobbying and and uh, uh, allowing the in ch chemical industry to bring in whatever they want. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about um, solutions for people when it comes to healing the gut. Uh, this is a specialty of yours, and you know I've, I've interviewed you on summits and docu series in the past. I know you have a docu series coming up as well. I'd love for you to talk about that, but. What are some solutions people can, I mean, we talked about a few, but, you know, let's make it practical and helpful for people because if all disease begins in a leaky gut, then this is really where we should start, right? That's right. If that's the only thing you're going to do, Mrs. Patient, is build a healthy, diverse microbiome that has more downstream effects and benefits than anything else you could do. It doesn't matter what vitamin you take. It doesn't matter. Uh, compared to putting your attention on building a healthy, diverse microbiome. So there are many, many steps to that. Um, in my, I have an online training program for healthcare practitioners called the Certified Gluten-Free Practitioner Program. And it's an hour presentation of just study after study after study. But the basic things to start with, um, uh, the first and most important is to make sure you're well hydrated. Uh, most people, you know, just pinch the back of your hand. If it doesn't go flat immediately, you're dehydrated. It should go flat immediately, not stick up and then taper down. Uh, and so it's a third of an ounce of water per pound, healthy water, as healthy as you can do, per pound body weight. And if you're sweating a lot, if you're doing saunas, which are great for you to get the toxins out of your body, infrared saunas, or you're exercising with a lot of sweat, it goes up to a half ounce of pound, half ounce of water per pound body weight. So that's first and most important is to make sure you're well hydrated because you have to escort stuff in and you have to escort stuff out. After that, fruits and vegetables, organic, critically, critically important. And we call it the rainbow diet. It's the colors of the rainbow. Uh, that we uh, recommend to you. And most people eat somewhere between five and 12 different fruits or vegetables every week, the same ones. We recommend you work up to, the goal is 50 a week, 50 different colors of the rainbow uh, concept. You know, so it's red tomatoes, blue berries, purple, cabbage, green, broccoli, you know, and you just keep Brussels sprouts, you just keep alternating the fruits and vegetables, mostly vegetables. Um, we've categorized fruits and vegetables in the same category, and they're really not. They're really not. Our ancestors didn't eat fruit every day. It wasn't available. Fruit is in the fall in most places of the world. Fruit is ripe to be picked in the fall. And when our ancestors ate a bunch of fruit, they put on weight. Their fat cells expanded to prepare for the winter. And so the idea of eating a whole lot of fruit every day, well, you know, it depends. 
you really want to check your blood sugar and make sure that you're not yo-yoing your blood sugar. Depends, where you, so live. Depends where you live, right? I mean, you live in Costa Rica, you could eat fruit year round pretty easily there. Sure, but sure. But you're not going to eat the was... same fruit. You're not going to eat the same thing because the same thing doesn't, you're going to eat variety if you're eating seasonally. That's true. That's true. But I was born and raised in Detroit and my genetics <laughs> tell me I'm 99% uh, Italian and Greek. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, my ancestors didn't eat fruit every day. Yep. My digestive system is not set up for that. I do have a little fruit every day because of where I live. You know, you don't have to be fanatical about this. We just have to keep in mind that, um, and the way you can tell, it's really easy nowadays. You put a CGM on your arm, a continuous glucose monitor. It's like a caffeine patch or a nicotine patch. And your phone will tell you immediately what your blood sugar is. And you wear it for a couple of weeks and you see the impact of the foods that you choose to eat and the volume of foods and the timing of foods. And you see, if you're making your blood sugar yo-yo, then you need to dial that down and keep your blood sugar more stable. If you want vitality in your senior years, if you want to have your biological age be different than your chronological age, so that you age gracefully, then you need to be aware of blood sugar. And that's a primary for most of us. It's not an addendum, an afterthought. You know, first, most important, water. You have to be hydrated, critically important. Second, fruits and vegetables. Third, the balance of fruits and vegetables and all of your foods, and especially if you're doing a lot of fruits, what's your blood sugar? On a, on a regular basis. So the CGM is an easy way now to do that. Can I share with you something about CGM? So yeah. I wanted to experiment with it. I've just, the last few weeks I've been wearing a CGM. I just took it off a couple of days ago and some really interesting things happen, right? So one, one caveat I would say for people is be mindful of, you know, when you have a, sli a slight glucose spike, there's nothing wrong with that, that it, when you eat, right. Glucose, you know, when you eat glucose, fructose containing foods, uh, carbohydrates, it's going to go up and it's going to come down as long as it doesn't remain in that spike for long periods of time or go above, you know, exponential numbers. I mean, if it's getting up to like 170, 180, 200, you have an issue there. CGMs are notoriously bad at, I mean, with a 20 per, up to a 20 percent uh, misreading as well. Even the best ones I used levels. They sent me Dexcom. G6, I think it was, these are like the best ones. And even those can have 15 to 20% misreading. So be mindful of that. I would recommend, uh, these are all things I learned as I've been using CGM, but as I got it and then where you place it too, I had it behind my arm and it had so many errors. And then I got it right between that shoulder and the tricep and it was significantly more accurate. And you can test mm. your blood on an actual blood test strip at the same mm -hmm. time to see how accurate it really is. So that's going to be your most mm -hmm. accurate. And that's how I was, I was tracking it. Right. Um, when I ate a pizza, this was a, um, a vegan pizza at a local restaurant. Okay. And gluten-free, gluten-free, gluten-free. I think it was like a cauliflower crust, mm -hmm. um, lots of veggies. Uh, one, one pizza, we put the vegan cheese on it. One, we had no cheese, right? I ate that pizza and my glucose spiked and had a higher number for longer after that pizza than any other thing I'd eaten up to that point. Mm -hmm. uh, fruits, rice, white rice, even white rice, tofu, fruits, vegetables, you know, all that. You, you get a nice little spike, comes back down. Every time I eat a normal whole food meal at home, nice little spike comes back down. No problem with that, right? I eat a pizza. And even it's a quote unquote healthy pizza and boom, huge spike and stayed high for quite a while and then back down. It just shows you how certain foods, you know, can, mm -hmm. can significantly impact your blood glucose. Now, if I was eating pizza and cheeseburgers and all this stuff every day, it'd be a concern and it probably, you know, be concerned about diabetes or heart disease or cancer down the road, but I don't eat that way. So a pizza once every two or three months out gluten-free with the family, not a big deal if you're eating organic. Right at home most of the time, right? Right, right. I agree with you on your overview. Completely agree with you on that. Yeah, and so th that's the value of having these kinds of monitoring devices that you can, holy cow, look at that. Right. It's really, really important. All right, yeah. so first is water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so next is uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, 
Next, Mrs. Patient, when you go shopping, uh, buy a couple of every root vegetable in the store. Organic, of course, but get turnips and parsnips and rutabagas and radishes and sweet potatoes. Not too many white potatoes because their effect on your, your blood sugar. Uh, sweet potatoes. Uh, you know, And you have at least one root vegetable every day. The fiber in root vegetables feeds the good bacteria in your gut. That's what your bacteria thrives on, is that fiber, that soluble fiber and insoluble, both kinds, that are in root vegetables. They, they love it and they convert the exhaust of their eating, produces these things called short chain fatty acids, which are really healthy for us. And they get in your bloodstream and they heal leaky brain and they heal leaky gut and they've got so many benefits. So you eat uh, one root vegetable every day and you alter the root vegetables because every root vegetable feeds different families of the good bacteria in the gut. They don't feed the bad bacteria. They feed the good bacteria. The bad bacteria thrives on whites, white paste, white rice, white bread, uh, white gluten-free products. And they sugar. feed the bad bacteria. And processed you know, sugar, so right? and processed sugar, right, right. So you eat uh, one root vegetable every day. Then you go on Google and you type in list of prebiotic foods. And that's the category of foods that feed the good guys in the gut. They're called prebiotics. And you print out the list and you have two from the list every day, which means a banana is a prebiotic, an onion is a prebiotic, garlic is a prebiotic. You're gonna learn that there's a lot of foods already in your diet on occasion that are prebiotics, but you just wanna be conscious of it and alternate them on a regular basis. Then when we start working with people, we usually give them a prebiotic supplement for a couple of months. Not too long, but while we're transitioning your eating style, let's make sure you've got plenty of the food to encourage more good bacteria. Next, when you go shopping, Mrs. Patient, I want you to buy five different types of fermented vegetables. Uh, sauerkraut, kimchi, miso, fermented beets, curry flavored, whatever you like, but get five different types because when vegetables ferment, they're producing the good families of bacteria and when you eat those fermented vegetables, you inoculate your gut with those good bacteria. And you alternate them every day because you'll get five different types so that you're alternating every once in a while. And your kids will like one more than another probably, which is okay. But you want to alternate them because each vegetable, when it ferments, produces different families of good bacteria. And you want to inoculate your gut with as many varieties of good bacteria as you can. So eat a little bit. The goal for an adult is to get up to about a tablespoon a day, which could be a teaspoon three times a day. Or a, I just grab a hunk of it and I throw it on my plate for one meal a day. Uh, you know, but sometimes you have to work up to it. So you might start with just a little bit. Uh, some people... Um, uh, don't like fermented vegetables at all. So you just take your spoon, get a little juice from the fermented vegetables and mix it with your mashed potatoes. Mm -hmm. Can't even taste it. Oh, it's But so it'll good. get down there. Get down there. Kimchi. I love, Next. I love a good spicy kimchi. Um, yeah. Coconut, coconut yeah. yogurt's a great one too. I mean, you got good probiotics into yogurt, for example. Yeah. Sauerkraut, even pickles, even pickles technically. Uh, yeah, are, there's a difference between pickles and vinegar, though, and yeah. pickles that are fermented, and, and you want the fermented ones. That's, that's yeah, right. And, that's you know, point. you don't see um, obese Koreans very often. They eat kimchi every day. Their guts, and many of you have heard the stories, and they're true. The studies are really true. If you take uh, the feces from an obese animal and you inject it into a skin, a skinny animal, the skinny animal gets obese. If you take the feces of a skinny animal and you inject it into an obese animal, the obese animal gets skinny. Mm -hmm. That it's the bacteria in your gut that have a great influence on your body composition. 
So you want to build the good guys in your gut, the diversity of good guys. You don't just take a pill of a probiotic uh, every day, which is not a bad thing to do, but you can't limit yourself to that. There's no diversity there, right? So you, And then, of course, Mrs. Patient, for a few months, I'd like you to take a pill of probiotics while we're building up your, your repertoire of good guys in the gut. But for a few months, two, three months should be enough you know, on that. Next, buy 10, 15 apples, always organic. Wash them, uh, don't peel them, cut the seeds out of them, chop them up into chunks and uh, uh, put them in a pot, add water to about a third the height of the apples, throw a little cinnamon in there. Uh, you can throw a little glutamine, you can throw a little curcumin in there if you like, turn it on high and boil for 10 to 15 minutes. You got applesauce, that's all it takes. And uh, the pectin in applesauce feeds arguably the most valuable enzyme in your gut called intestinal alkaline phosphatase, IAP, which lowers high cholesterol, lowers high triglycerides, stabilizes insulin sensitivity, reduces insulin resistance, uh, locks up LPS, these bad bacteria, so they can't get into your bloodstream, uh, the list goes on and on of what intestinal alkaline phosphatase does, and you increase it by having a little pectin. And homemade applesauce is a great source of pectin. And so you, not the store-bought applesauce, it's homemade. Have your kids help you make it. It's simple. They're involved in preparing food at that, you know, that way, and applesauce tastes great. You know, you can, you can add a few raisins to it if you want. And uh, you have a couple tablespoons a day. You can have more if you want, but at least a couple of tablespoons a day. You're just feeding that environment in your gut to make it a healthier, stronger environment. Now, is there a benefit and, to the applesauce versus just eating a raw apple every day? Well, you can do, uh, it's two apples a day. It, it, um, so it, it really should be, uh, and you know, a doctor, uh, an apple a day keeps the doctor away? No, two apples a day keep the doctor away. <laughs> And so, you know, you cross out the uh and put the number two there on a bumper sticker. Two apples a day, keep the doctor away. And it really works. Yeah. Yeah. Brayburn, uh, Red Delicious, um, uh, and Gala are the three most impactful varieties that I've seen. Always organic because apples have been on the dirty dozen every year for many, many years. They use lots of chemicals on apples and you, you don't want all those chemicals. So that's a good basic overview of how you get started in building a healthier microbiome. Yeah, that's super helpful. Plenty, plenty of uh, great takeaways there. Um, now you have, people want to go deeper with you and your work. I know you've got an upcoming docu-series you, you've put a lot of time and energy into. Um, I, I know you've got uh, consulting through your website. Uh, you do a lot. You work with patients all over the world. Can you talk a little bit about your upcoming series uh, as well? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we've spent the last year on this. I'm not a professional producer of these events. This will be my third one in 11 years. And uh, it's paradigm shifting, and it's all about this concept of low-grade chronic inflammation under the surface that's there for years before you ever have a symptom, and uh, it's called the inflammation equation, and it's theinflammationequation.com, and uh, you, what, what you're going to learn are all of the little steps. It's an hour a day for nine days, not too long, with a lot of handouts and uh, I've got a video that does the entire, I think it's almost an hour on building a healthy microbiome. It's all the little things, you know, for example, I forgot to mention uh, three or four walnuts a day have a great impact on increasing one of the really important good bacteria in your gut called acromantia, you know, so you, know, you just have a few, just three or four, it's all it takes every day um, or m multiple times a week. You said, so, you said I, acronomsia, got... not necromancer, right? Just clarifying. No, Acker, A-K-K-E-R, <laughs> A-K-K-E-R, mancia. It's, it's arguably the most dominant good guy in your gut. 
and uh, uh, it helps to heal leaky brain and leaky guts. Many, many benefits to having adequate amounts of acromancia. But in our event, we've got lots of handouts. We've got the handouts from NASA on house plants. Two six-inch house plants in a 10 by 10 room absorb 74% of the toxins in the air. So you clean up your air in your house. We're teaching people about all of the things to do, step-by-step -step things. And when you register at um, theinflammationequation.com, uh, the gift that we're giving everybody is the full interview. See, because I've interviewed over 60, 64, I think it is, world-class scientists like Sean Feld that I talked about earlier and, and many others. I went to nine different countries to interview these people. And we put the series together. Every day is a story. So there's nine minutes of this scientist and eight minutes of this one and 14 minutes of this one and six minutes of this patient. And it's the story for the day, like inflammation for the day or about food choices for the day or about sleep and how important sleep is for the day. And you get all these pearls in there with it on a daily basis. Uh, but the interviews themselves were all over an hour, you know, but we're not showing 64 hours of all that, but they're available if somebody wants them. But I'm giving you the full interview with Fran Drescher, the nanny, when you register and you just, you see what an incredible human being she is. And, you know, she was diagnosed with uh, cancer 23 years ago, uh, uh, uterine cancer. And she founded Cancer Schmancer as a result of that. And she talks about, you make your home your sanctuary. Your home is, first, your body is your sanctuary. And she said, you know, when I was smoking, when in my teenager, in my early 20s, I was smoking. And one day I realized, why am I poisoning my lungs? Why don't I love my lungs? You know, and she started laughing that laugh of hers. And that New York accent of hers, which is so engaging. But she realized, you know, I was treating my lungs very, very poorly. And uh, uh, she's, you treat your body like a sanctuary. And you learn how to take care of it. And it will take care of you. And she looks great, you know. She's in her, uh, my, I assume, her mid-60s, maybe. I don't know, somewhere. It's always dangerous to try to guess a woman's <laughs> age. But, dangerous to you know, try and guess uh, anybody's age, man. I'm terrible yeah. at it. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're what, 40s? They're like, I'm 27. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Right, right. Never right. mind. I'm not making guesses anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I, I'm giving everybody that full interview with Fran because it's so empowering of all. She says, you just take one, you put one foot in front of each other. How do you walk? You walk with one foot in front of the other. <laughs> you know, she has that laugh of hers, <laughs> which I really can't mimic, but it's just so funny. Yeah. But she says, you put, you put one foot in front of the other. That's how you change the direction of your life. And so that's our event. It's a nine-day event. And you can find more at the inflammationequation.com. With the, the word the is in the domain, the, the right. inflammation equation.com. And it's free, right? Correct. It's totally free. It's all free. Everything's free. Awesome. Beautiful. I love it. There you go, guys. Go check it out. The inflammation equation.com. Dr. Tom. Hey, man. I, awesome. Having you on the podcast. Um, this was, this was uh, really a wonderful, wonderful uh, interview. And you delivered a tremendous amount of value um appreciate you appreciate you coming on thank you nathan appreciate you too man it's great to see you again absolutely good to see you too take care bye-bye thank you for listening to the nathan crane podcast please make sure to subscribe and share this on social media then head over to nathancrane.com for your free ebook so when we're talking about you know what are these underlying causes and conditions of these chronic diseases cancer diabetes, heart disease, they all have very similar, if not identical causes. And that's the thing is when we get to the root cause of these diseases, we can not only prevent these diseases from ever happening, but empower our bodies to heal from them. In every one of our cells, we have tens and hundreds of thousands of chemical reactions that are happening every second that are cycling uh, back and forth. It's like sort of a, a yin and yang.
And you know, for me, the soul, soul's purpose is evolution. It doesn't care about comfort, it cares about evolution. Mm. And so I think so long as we are following our soul, then we will evolve. And I think what sometimes blocks us from living our purpose, from manifesting that next level of our expression, is we have not evolved. There is also a time for letting go all the expectations and relax and just breathe and be grateful what, for what you have achieved.